Good evening and welcome to tonight's very special edition of Tisky Sour. Apologies for going ever so slightly late. Uh, we had a few technical problems at our end. Uh, tonight's show is obviously very special because we're joined by former Shadow Chancellor, absolute Don of the left, John McDonnell. How are you doing, John? The tech, let's be honest, the technical problems were the, at my end, weren't they? Well, that's because we were introducing you to a new a new streaming <laughs> platform. I hear you're an expert at Zoom. So. Well, I, I seem to be living on Zoom at the moment, but um, also I couldn't, anyway, never mind, I couldn't get loaded up on laptop. So the worst, the most difficult technical problem is being able to prop up my phone without it falling <laughs> down. Anyway, we've well, managed. If it, if it falls down during the show, we'll all be very forgiving. <laughs> uh, I'm also joined by Aaron Bastani, who is probably the most consistently uh capable with with technology when it comes to any anyone at navarra media except hair clippers oh except hair <laughs> clippers yeah aaron aaron's um aaron's feeling embarrassed because he, he got exactly the same haircut i got he, he messaged yeah. me this morning saying like oh, i thought it was number two but it was two millimeters which is exactly exactly I thought it was grade two, which is six millimeters which even that would be dramatic but yeah it was a third of that well, where did you get a haircut Oh, I just I will have a pair of clippers from like ten years ago, so I thought oh, I'll brush yeah. those off. And <laughs> you haven't thought about having a, a sort of COVID lockdown shave of your head, John? Oh, um, do you know if it goes on like this, I might well have to. <laughs> so the format of tonight's show, we're going to um, we're going to talk about the Labour leaks, um, which we know our audience are all very interested in, and we could talk about coronavirus. Um, and the the Tories' response and what what John thinks of that, and we're going to kind of tag team. And so I'm going to pass you over to to Aaron for the first part to talk about the Labour leaks because he's been really taking a lead on that. First of all, thank you all for watching. We want to get more people into this feed. We love it when people watch live. So please tweet on the hashtag Tisky Sour and share the show link. Uh, Aaron, I'm going to bring you in on the Labour leaks. Yeah, let's talk about the Labour leaks. I mean, obviously, we've had a lot of people criticise us saying. Oh, you know, the coronavirus is a huge story. It's probably one of the biggest stories of the century. Um, can you not talk about that instead? And of course, we've talked about coronavirus as well. Uh, but the left can't seem to win on this because you talk about the coronavirus, you're bringing down the government. Uh, you're not getting uh, on the right side of things. And if you, you don't talk about coronavirus, well, how dare you talk about anything else? Uh, but it was good to see that you, you were feeding into this, John, and you've been quite a, an authoritative voice um, on Sky a couple of days ago. You sort of fed in. I just wanted to basically... Uh, ask some questions of you in regards to the, the findings so far or the alleged findings of the document. Uh, Fox, if we can if we can just bring up uh, graphic one. Uh, this was the article I think we ran last Sunday. It's going to be a long night. How members of Labour's senior management team campaign to lose. Uh, I don't know if you've read that, John, that article. We have to be careful here because as, you, as you've experienced, there's all sorts of legal threats flying around here. Um, so let's just, can I just situate it where I think we are at the moment? Because I I, um, I saw the leaked document when it went online, mm. um, and that's the first I'd actually seen it. Mm. Um, so, and the only, I, I didn't say anything initially, I just kept relatively quiet. So I wanted to just have a chance to read it. It's 800 pages, it's extraordinary, mm. really. Mm. I'm reading um, Hilary Mantel's latest book, which is about the same sort of length. <laughs> if you if you read them together, there's a hell of a lot of comparisons by the mm. looks of it as well. But the um, so I did I, I read it through uh, and didn't comment anything until I think it was Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, and I, I set up an interview with Sky. And the reason I, I commented then was because um, we were getting well, I was getting emails and texts and WhatsApps and all the rest from all over the place, but also we were getting quite a feedback that we were losing members mm. that people were resigning pretty angry disillusioned in disgust and someone had to say something about look uh, stay for god's sake stay we've got to sort sort this out my understanding and you've read it as much as me but my understanding of the background is it of it is that the labor party were, were um, jenny Formey's general secretary quite properly was um, commissioned a response to the hrc investigation um, Jeremy and I knew and some form of response was being prepared, but it was from the party. It wasn't from us as the then leadership. 
Um, and we knew room, all sorts of rooms were flying around that it was going to be quite a detailed and lengthy response, page after page after page. But we never do anything more than that. But my understanding is that what Jenny Formby commissioned it, the, uh, a small team worked on it and then prepared a report um, for submission to the HRC. And then the Labour Party lawyers advised against its submission. I'm not completely sure why. It might well be that there's issues in the what was prepared around staffing matters and, and there were other legal implications with employment law, etc. Um, so it, the, what we heard was then it, it wasn't to be submitted and then the thing got leaked. Now, my understanding is actually a report was prepared, which was fully redacted, mm. but someone leaked the unredacted report. I mm. don't think anyone who leaked the unredacted report has done anyone any favours because it does open up the Labour Party to all sorts of threats of um, you know, offences against the data protection legislation. However, it's out there now and we have to work on the basis of these are allegations. Um, there's a lot of um, information within the report itself that has come from, from what we understand, if we read the report, the internal communications mm. of, between staff at Labour HQ. Mm. Uh, and that includes, it appears that includes a WhatsApp, um, not just emails, etc., but also WhatsApp that was put on the email system. And if you if you read the, well, you've read it, if you read it, um, this, if you read just the internal communications that are set out in the report, leave aside any commentary in the report itself, Itself, just the internal communications, if they're accurate, uh, and no one, I, I, I don't believe anyone's contested so far, I don't believe anyone's contested so far the accuracy of the individual bits of um, communications material that's in the report. If you read it, it is it's really shocking. It is shocking. It is absolutely shocking. And we, kn we knew when Jeremy took over um, there was elements of hostility to him, not just in the parliamentary aid party. If you remember, on Jer when Jeremy first was elected, on the day of his election, when he's doing his his speech thanking people for supporting him and setting out his views on the way forward, on the BBC at the time, there was a sort of band going across the bottom of the TV with the names of shadow cabinet members who were resigning mm. whilst he was speaking. It was quite remarkable. So we knew there was some hostility in the Parliamentary Labour Party, but also we did we did immediately pick up a, sort of that feeling of things weren't right at Labour HQ, elements of hostility, you could feel it. Uh, and things like, um, you know, we never had control of the National Executive Committee then, so things just not getting done when you thought they would be done and things being delayed. And there was just a, an atmosphere, you just think, you know, you did for the first couple of years. We we just weren't in control. There was no, there was no feeling that actually, when you made the decision, it would necessarily be carried out. But if you look at the internal communications within the report, again, if they're accurate, if it's true, and as I say, the the detail of who said what to whom doesn't seem to have been contested so far. Mm. It's it's it is really shocking it is really shocking and also some of the abuse as well um mm. against against black members dawn dawn butler and clive and lewis and um what they what was being done to to diane diane abbott as well was just that just appalling so when i read the report there was that suspicion stuff was going on but you couldn't pin it down mm. uh, but when you read the report it sort of began for me, I thought, well, actually, from what they've been saying to one another, that level of hostility was pretty grim. And the other issue for me is that um, on the anti-Semitism issue, um, I throughout the period when Shami Chakrabarti did a report onwards, um, I was raising questions all the time with um, that shadow cabinet and with Ian McNichol, who's then the general secretary, about you know what's happening, uh, what's the scale of it, um, how the case is being progressed, uh, and I was always critical about didn't seem to be going fast enough. Yeah. Um, 
And also uh, the expression I use were not fast enough and not ruthless enough. And I, mm. there was one example where someone had been suspended and then the suspension had been lifted. And I thought, well, that's, that seemed odd to me because it seemed a quite a serious case to me. And so all the way through, if the report is accurate, mm. if it is accurate, if it is true, all the way through what we were being told about the speed of processing, the effectiveness of the system, was totally inaccurate. And what got to me, really, and that's why I got pretty angry last week in reading it all, was that I was going on TV and radio briefed mm. that everything was going well. We were on mm. top of things. It, these issues were being dealt with. Mm. And and I'm you're put in an extremely vulnerable situation when you do that sort of thing for your own reputation. So what made me angry, I thought, well, if this is true, I am furious. I'm bloody furious about it. And mm. it needs sorting out. So when Keir announced the investigation, I, I, I fully agreed. I that's the best way to do it, get an independent investigation. He's, he was on a Zoom call with Andrew Rayner last week to party members and said it will be independent and it, will, it won't it will be kicked into long grass. It will be speedy. Uh, we haven't heard yet who's going to do that um, investigation yet. And I'm hoping there's a quick consultation with the officers of the National Executive Committee and it can be got underway. And I've been doing Zoom meetings with constituencies, with Labour Party members all around the country, just saying to them, look, it's underway now. Everyone's shocked. Um, everyone's really shocked. Uh, and, and it has implications for the real world if if all that's in the report is accurate. Mm. Um, because for most of those members... In 2017, well, you two know, people slogged their guts out in that general election campaign, you know, in all <laughs> in all weathers, knocking on the doors, delivering the le leaflets, hitting those phone banks. And people, I've never seen an election campaign like it in terms mm. of a mass, mass campaign. People's creativity was incredible as well, you have to admit. It was a great campaign. And we came so close. We just, you know, the latest calculation is it, if spread about two and a half thousand votes mm. in a number of constituencies mm. we would have had a Labour government and then someone said to me it's the point that you made at the beginning of the program Michael someone said to me well we're in the middle of a coronavirus and people are dying why are you raising this well my response was of course all our attention it's all that everything we do has got to be about coronavirus and saving lives and I'm really worried about what's happening at the moment and I'm terrified about what's going to happen as this develops in the global south as well mm. but the real other issues in your life do intrude even in these situations mm. and so that report has intruded and what i think what upset me the most last week was thinking through it and talking to um, colleagues and comrades here in my own constituency and we just talked it through we would now if if we'd have won that election if we hadn't been undermined in that way, if it is true in the report, we could have had a Labour government, we'd be into our third year of a Labour government. We would have fully funded the NHS. All those nurses and health workers that we go out and clap on a Thursday night, they would have had the pay rise that the Tories voted against, if you remember. They, mm. they would have the decent pay rise, and I think they desperately needed it. But also... If you look back on it, in our um, manifesto in 2017, we were going to set up a national care service. Mm -hmm. So we would have rolled that out and we'd worked up the detail of it. And that would have provided the social care mm -hmm. that many of the elderly and people with vulnerabilities and disabilities desperately need. And they're the, the group that are suffering the most in this crisis. So we would have been so much better prepared to deal with this coronavirus crisis and outbreak pandemic that we're experiencing at the moment so actually it does have relevance to the coronavirus crisis and that's what i think was so deeply distressing i've been as i say i've been talking to party members saying this investigation has got to be absolutely thorough and yeah of course if 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 the report is true and what we find is accurate with regard to certain behaviors of some of the senior echelons of the staff um, who were employed by the Labour Party at the time. Well, my view is that, you know, you have to use the disciplinary mechanisms. And in any other instance, with a serious charge like this, you, if it's been investigated, you'd normally suspend the party members that are being investigated because if they are serious charges. 
and then if they are proved and it is true well expulsion is the only the, the, the solution itself but i'm hoping that as i say that the investigation will get be get underway soon and it will be independent and we can get the results of that the other issue for me as well um is in addition to learning about what went on we've got to learn some of the lessons about it as well and we need now a, a program of intensive debate about the democratic reform we need within the party so that as i say if if the report proves to be accurate um we 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 ensure the party members are actually given back control of the party against and that we never allow a sort of bureaucracy that seems to have appeared if this report is accurate to to establish that sort of level of power and influence because I've no, you know, if it's true, you know, to actually have a group of senior staff within the Labour Party um, preventing a Labour government being elected, you know, and the, the allegations are they were, you know, they've tried to fix the leadership election to prevent Jeremy off the off the ballot, getting on the ballot paper, um, f stitching up parliamentary selections, mm -hmm. and in, and if it's true as well, one of the discussions was even even throwing a parliamentary by-election for, for political advantage. It, God, if this is accurate and the, in, and the investigation proves it to be, it's just staggering, absolutely staggering. I'll ask two quick questions, because obviously mm. it's quite clear you don't want to talk about the, the, the substance necessarily. And I, le legally speaking, I think, that's, I think that's the right thing to do. But on two quite important issues, firstly, do you think that those mentioned in the report, particularly senior management members, do you think they should be suspended pending investigation? Because I think in most organisations, that's that's what would happen. And then the second question, because it's, it's a process question as well, so I put them together. Do you, do you think that if there is a, a single whistleblower um, who got that document out and we can have the conversation about redacted or unredacted, do you think that given there are laws in this country which do cover whistleblowers, do you think given the, the public interest of exposing this story, how would you feel about their treatment? Do you think they merit legal legal sort of cover? Okay. There's two, let's go through the two things there. Um, I said publicly last week, and I've, I've just written an article for publication over the next 24 hours, which says that in the normal process of the Labour Party, um, if you're if a serious charge is brought against you, mm. or you're implicated in something serious mm. um, like this, um, allegedly, well, the normal process you would be suspended pending the investigation outcome, mm. and that's what I would expect here. And I think no matter how senior um, the people involved or um, the allegations are made against, mm. it doesn't matter. They should be treated like every other party member. And as you say, Aaron, any, in any other organisation, that would apply anyway. If it's a mm. serious matter, you're usually suspended until the investigation is over. That's mm. fair enough. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, the, me the members of staff who wrote the report um, were, were doing exactly as asked of them which was researching and preparing a report for submission to the HRC. So that's it. They're doing their job. That's it. Um, whoever leaked it uh, in unredacted form, well, leaked it anyway, but especially in unredacted form, I think it was, have behaved, my own view, I think they were wrong. They've been behaved incredibly badly. And remember, with the data protection issues, you're, you're dealing with possibly the criminal law as well. So I think that was, I actually think that was appalling. I think it was a real mistake. Because actually, if the report had been prepared and submitted to the NEC, even if it hadn't gone as far as the HRC, in an unredacted form, it was sufficient to enable a more thorough investigation to take place. However, um, we've all, in addition to data protection, as, as you said, Dan, there are also laws to protect whistleblowers in mm -hmm. this country as well. And I think it, some would argue, and I, I, I think I'd be one of them, that an element of whistleblowing has gone on here and therefore that those protections uh, whoever those that person is or those people are they should they should be afforded that that protection um the, the issue for us i think and that's why it's interesting isn't it um what's interesting is what comes out of um the um information on the internal communication so almost like some of these conversations that took place which again i've from what i've heard i don't know but what i've heard so far haven't been contested they didn't these they didn't just like 
disliked Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. They were attacking Ed Miliband and Andy Burnham as well. And I saw Andy Burnham tweet out last weekend. <laughs> you know, it was just the you know. It's very difficult to define Andy Burnham as a trot, isn't it? In anyone's in anyone's description. Well, know? there's one but, there's one line but, where it says most of the parliamentary Labour Party are trots, and you just think yeah, this has gone past any sort of any reasonable conversation. Now. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does also um, in, in the descriptions of some people as trots as well. It it does it does betray their lack of understanding of. Um, Russian history, let alone the development of uh, Marxism in, in, mm. uh, across the globe as well. It's just bizarre. And it, some of the language that's used, it's almost like student politics from yeah. 20 or 30 years ago, you know. Yeah. But, you know, if, if it's true, it's been incredibly damaging. And the, the thing is, it's, it must be heartbreaking for people who've, you know, worked so hard in that election and we came so close. And you think what we could have been doing over the last three years is just... I don't know. It's distressed in the state, the least. Michael, I'll hand over to you. We could talk about this all night, but there's the coronavirus as well. <laughs> talk also towards the end of the show more about what, what the left should do in response to this and how the Labour left should be organised. But I do, first of all, want to talk about the coronavirus, the, the Tories' response to it and how Labour has has chosen to you know act in these, in these extraordinary times. Uh, before we go on to that, there's 2,800 of you watching. We want to get to 3,000. Uh, so share this show, get a few more people in here watching, share the show link. I also want to get our subscribers numbers up. So if you're someone who's watching this show and are not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, hit that button now. Um, I want to introduce this section with some of the revelations that were in the, the explosive article in the Sunday Times yesterday. Uh, some of you may have seen it. We made a short video about it, uh, but it's... You know, it's, it's an important way to frame this discussion, I think. So it, what it revealed is that Johnson skipped five COBRA meetings on coronavirus, not attending his first until March. So during February, where, you know, it was, it was the most important period of time for the government to prepare our country for COVID-19 coming. He spent 12 days uh, at a country house, basically having a holiday. And there were also some pretty striking quotes. So I just want to get up one. This is a senior advising to Downing Street, told the paper, what you learn about Boris was he didn't chair any meetings. He liked his country breaks. He didn't work weekends. It was like working for an old-fashioned chief executive in a local authority 20 years ago. There was a real sense that he didn't do urgent crisis planning. It was exactly like people feared he would be. Uh, so the article it also suggests that you know key, key scientists had been warning the government about the, ex the extent and scale of the problem with coronavirus back at the end of Feb back at the end of January, early February. You know, it just shows the the government to be fairly negligent and it comes right up to the present day as well so on the first of eight it's not till the first of april um that the the chief executives of the trade bodies for testing labs and for ppe uh, were contacted and asked to you know join the national effort uh, to protect our, our health workers and, and you know get the population tested um so i wanted to go to you john first of all for a sort of yeah. comment on this um but also i suppose a challenge in the sense that what the Tories are saying now is that, oh, it's all very well to say this in hindsight, but we were doing what the what the science told us at the time. For you, what do you think the Labour Party would have done differently? Not in the not so much in the long term in terms of you know ending austerity, which would have made our healthcare system better. But what what would you have been doing in in January and February that would have made us better prepared for where we are right now? Well, it's it's what we we were doing. We were we were beginning to raise then our, our concerns about the seriousness of the potential pandemic and what its implications were, and so we were then and we you know we we took the line that we'll try and work with the government as best we can, um, try and ensure that we provided our our advice to government, and then if we felt work wasn't being undertaken yes we would we'd raise issues with them and actually yeah if necessary criticize our line all the way through um, at that stage i was dealing with the economic implications but our line john ashworth was dealing with the health side uh, and shami chakrabarti and others were dealing with with diane as well with some of the issues around civil liberties as well depending on the type of legislation that might need to be developed um, and our line at that time was follow the scientific advice. But if you, if you go back and look, search the records, John Ashworth at that point in time, quite rightfully, 
was saying you need to be open and transparent about the, uh, the advice you're getting, both in terms of the science, but also the clinical advice too. And actually also what we are suggesting then is if there are differences of opinion, we'd rather those differences of opinion were published and that we could understand therefore how judgments were being made. And when you're in this sort of situation, you, of course, what you've got to do is try and um, just try and ensure you're not into knockabout politics or anything like that. You're trying to be as constructive as possible. But at times you have to draw a line in the sand and say, well, you're not doing it right. And that's it. And what was interesting on a whole series of issues, we were putting issues to them and recommending things. And then if they didn't follow it, we would go public. And interesting enough, they usually fell into line. So. For example, the daily press conferences, that was us. We actually said that at the very beginning, your communication strategy has to be absolutely key. And we pushed them into doing a daily announcement of some sort, either in the media or to the House of Commons. And they did. They started the daily press conferences. When it came, um, when it came to the, the financial response, um, I, I, I kept the record of the statements I made um, first of all, it was I can remember doing a Thursday and a Friday some weeks ago where I was actually saying that just how urgent the um, urgent the need was to put in place the economic protections for workers, etc. And also at that point, I was strongly arguing um, that we needed to have this as an international a globally coordinated strategy. And we published a sort of I published a sort of five point plan and we submitted a detail of that to government. Rishi Sunak delayed. He did his budget and it wasn't nowhere near enough. And we said that at the time, the protections weren't good enough. The following week, they started, I think they went into a bit of a panic. They then start bringing forward proposals. Each one of them just wasn't good enough. It wasn't far. But what's interesting, Rishi Sunak publishes the first proposal, which is the job protection scheme. I responded within half an hour of his press conference and actually said there's huge gaps in this. It isn't going to protect people, um, particularly the self-employed. It wasn't going to protect small business. The way it, I got a tsunami of attacks then, it was just extraordinary. It was like, it was like uh, I was being accused of treachery, betraying the country, and you know, all part playing party politics. No, I wasn't. I actually went out there, welcomed his proposals, and said actually they just don't go far enough. And also. The point I made then as well, waiting for the people having to wait till June for the money as well, wasn't good enough either. I got really savaged in both the mainstream media and also all the social media stuff as well. But so you had to be careful as you raised issues that you actually did preface it by saying, look, I welcome this, but let's go further. So our attitude was always constructive engagement, but it, increasingly it got really frustrating because like, for example, the lockdown, um, the Monday, the weekend before the lockdown was announced by, um, by, by Boris Johnson, we'd had a discussion, we had a, a shadow cabinet subgroup with Jeremy and myself, John Ashworth and um, Shami and others. Um, and we just, uh, we got to the point, I think it was the Sunday, I said, this can't go on like this because this isn't working. People being forced into work. Uh, it was clearly the social distancing that advice wasn't working. And so we actually then on the Monday, uh, we told Johnson that we needed a more thorough lockdown. It had to happen and that we couldn't wait for them. We were going to go public. So on the Monday morning, we sent John Ashworth out in a media round. He made it clear. And then in the evening, they delayed their press conference and then they announced a more thorough lockdown. And if you look at the pattern of behavior by the government, that's exactly exactly happened at each stage. On the test, it was the WHO said test, 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 test and track. We've consistently argued that all the way through. On the PPE, we were already get submitting things to the government saying actually the distribution of PPE is well. First of all, the principles of on how it's used is absolutely critical. Get them clear, and then PPE distribution was wasn't working. We've got I, what's happened up until literally, I think, this this last week is that the attitude of trying to work with them, be constructive, push them to take decisions um, has worked to a certain extent. But then you realise, actually, this is getting much too much too serious. And so 
over this last um, last few days, this last week or so, uh, and I did it over the weekend as well. Um, actually, this argument that you know opposition for opposition's sake isn't right. Well, no one's doing opposition for opposition's sake. We're people have just had enough. People are dying out mm-hmm. there, and the stuff in uh, the stuff, for example, in care homes, which I think has been completely neglected. I'm really worried about, really worried, the number of staff that are now self-isolated, the number of staff that are ill, and the number of um, elderly residents in residential homes now where, who are suffering and who have tragically uh, died for a large number of them. I think that's been an absolute failure of policy and prioritisation. And you, I, who else can you blame? You have to blame the Prime Minister. You have to blame the government. And I, whether they're still pursuing this herd, herd immunity theory or not, the, the policies that they've been pursuing certainly haven't worked. And it looks as though we could we could have the worst instance in the whole of Europe of the mm. scale of death in relation to population. So it clearly hasn't worked. Um, I, I want to get up a couple of couple of tweets you did on yeah. on the weekend because they got a lot of yeah. attention. I want to see you know what the what the thinking was behind them. So I'm just going to get them up now for the audience to see. So on, I think this was yesterday. Had enough now with government failures. It's not opposition for opposition's sake to call out government's failure to pursue a effective test and track program and supply basic protection to frontline staff and to neglect support for care homes and care workers. People are dying as a result. The next one. Of course, we also need an open discussion about eventual exit strategy, but people are dying and being put at risk by government failures. Also, I fear in exit planning, we will see business lobby override health considerations and profit yet again be put before people's safety. And so when I read that, I was wondering if you were, you know, suggesting that potentially the current um, shadow cabinet haven't got the balance quite right. Obviously, they're, you know, it's, it's a difficult it's a difficult moment for them to decide how oppositional can we be, but do you think they're potentially deferring too much? Well, it's it's like walking a tightrope in, in all of these things. But the point, actually, I wasn't criticising um, Keir Starmer or the front bench. I was trying to say, look, you're going to get criticised. People are already saying, you know, you're, you're, this is party political, it's knockabout, it's opposition for op- opposition's sake. And I say, no, it isn't, actually. It isn't. Um, people are out there dying. People are really suffering, and we've got to be. I think we've got to be. We've got to call it out, and we've got to call it out. I think now we're at that stage where we we need to call it out much more thoroughly and more more directly. Um, and you know, the press conferences where we're told um, the the large volumes of PPE are being delivered, and then we discover. They haven't, or they're on a boat from Turkey or on the aeroplane from Turkey, and they're not being delivered. I phoned around my local care homes to see how they were, and they were struggling with PPE. Uh, and that's, you know, my cousin up in, in Liverpool, she's been uh, working with volunteers where they're, they're creating their own and distributing because the government supply isn't enough, both in terms of care and the NHS itself. So the, my first tweet was saying, just I've had enough now. I've listened to all the press conferences. It doesn't seem to relate to the reality of what's on the ground, full stop. And saying these things isn't opposition for opposition's sake. It is just being honest to force the government to act. That's the first thing. The second thing was on the exit strategy. They've been raising this issue about um, what the government's exit strategy is. My own view at the moment, the exit strategy is secondary just to saving lives at the moment. Let's just concentrate as much as possible on saving lives. And the best way of doing that isn't just the PPE, it's getting the testing done and doing mass testing and tracking. That's the best way in which I think you can deal with this crisis. And the government just, I don't think, have appreciated it, just haven't appreciated the scale of testing that's needed. And to give John Ashworth his due, consistently he's been calling for that and made representations to government directly to the Secretary of State to do it as well. But I just don't think the government understood um, the scale upon which it was needed. And then in the organisation of the testing and arrangements, I don't think have been in any way competent about going going about. That's the first thing. But with regard to the exit strategy, I'm worried. And you saw some Tory politicians the build-up about um, how we should now start 
relaxing the lockdown and getting back to work, etc. Well, in the early periods um, of, the, of this last month, in the first weeks this last month, it's still happening. I was still campaigning with the construction workers to shut the sites because mm. large numbers of workers were still being forced into work on construction sites with no, sa no social distancing. It's almost impossible and very little sanitation as well. And what I've had case after case of people contacting me where they've been forced into work in inessential roles and they feel they're being put at risk. And my worry was is that I think there's a number of Tory politicians and others who will be arguing that we we um, start sending people back into work. And I, my fear is in doing that, we're going to put people's lives at risk. It's as simple as that. So my view is concentrate on the real issues at the moment, which are getting the PPE out there for protection, making sure that um, that, that we are having, we're developing the testing on a mass scale now then start talking about the exit strategy, but fend off those who actually, as we've seen even up until now, are more interested in making profits than protecting people. I'm still getting people contacting me from call centres where they're not being protected. And the online shopping has forced people into warehouses again, where again, in many instances, you know, we've got the JD Sports Workers campaigning now, and you've seen what's happened in, in a number of other areas where people... Actually, uh, I think as a result of exploitative employers have had their health put at risk. I'm going to pass you over to Aaron in one sec. First of all, just going to read a couple of tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. John R. Taylor tweets, uh, this Labour report is an important document that is fundamental to understanding a major turning point in UK history where social democracy failed to reestablish itself in the UK. Uh, I agree with that. I imagine John will too. Uh, we'll be reading. We'll, we'll read some more tweets as we go through. Um, Aaron, I'm going to bring you in. Oh, Aaron's muted. I muted myself. Sorry, Fox. <laughs> um, we've got about three thousand people watching, um, but one thousand five hundred likes. So if you can't afford to make a one-off payment or a monthly subscription, that's fine. Just smash the like button. It costs absolutely nothing. Um, and it helps get this this great interview with John, very important figure on the UK left uh, for the last five years and probably for a lot longer going forward as well. Maybe even maybe even more so. We'll talk about that uh, very shortly, the future of the UK left. Uh, I just want to really sort of ask a few questions now with regards to general election, John, because I, I think we've got critical distance now. I think the, the leadership elections over yeah, a lot, yeah. a lot of. A lot of enmity. I think basically coronavirus has just changed everything so rapidly that people are sort of looking at the bigger picture probably much more quickly than otherwise would have been the case. Um, and obviously it's a it's a it's a order of magnitude bigger than Brexit. You know, so the sort of big political conversations of the last year, two years are kind of just subsumed within this. I looked at um, maybe Fox can get this graphic up. We had this uh, poll out today. I think the Tories are polling 51, uh, Labour on 32. They're up three, to be fair. Um, but Labour's vote was basically, uh, its increase was basically purely on the back of the Greens and Lib Dems, who've just collapsed. Yeah. Uh, and the Lib Dems aren't aren't coming back anytime soon. They're on sort of 5 6%, generally speaking. You were one of the sort of um, voices to say, well, you never said it explicitly, so I'm not going to ventriloquise you, but to sort of lean into that centre ground, middle England vote. Given the Tories are now on 51%, here's a question. Do, do you think the Tories did that more successfully instead? And, and we just weren't reading it? Or do you think that strategy of, okay, here's the fault line on Brexit, progressive values, regressive values, closed, open. Do you, do you think that was a mistake for Labour to lead into that? Or do you think if they'd done it earlier, I've heard people say that, that things potentially could have turned out differently? I'm, I'm not completely sure of your question. Uh, I, uh, uh, that's me being dense, and I apologise. I've never... Um... I've never advocated this lean into the middle class vote sort of stuff. I'm not into that. I, my view has always been, it's a bit, maybe it's a bit crude. My view has always been, uh, you, you, you basically do your analysis of what society is and what's needed. You set out the policies and then you campaign around them and you will attract, you will attract votes um, from across the piece based upon those policies. And, mm. It is, a, you know, it is about, you know, convincing people that society needs to be transformed and it has to be transformed in people's material interests. Of course it does. And the people who needed to benefit most from a Labour government uh, are, are working class people, and especially those 
in the most precarious forms of employment, etc. So I've never been what well, I've never been that. So I've never been into that. Um, uh, you know, we, we've got to pick up these middle class votes here. So we've got to pander to certain. I think you just go out there and say, this is what I understand about society. This is what I don't like about it. This is what I like about it. This is what I want to change. And this is what I want to build upon. And then you 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 couch the you couch the um, policies that you're pursuing in that overall narrative of your analysis of society. So in that sense, that's my overall political strategy and how you electorally. But then also what you try and do, you obviously you you try to be professional about it as well. So um, you know, I, I ran the GLC campaign and. Um, what we did then, we were the first um, really political movement that was really doing detailed polling, focus groups and using creative agencies. But it wasn't going along to people and saying, what do you want to hear or what mm. do you want us to say? It was, this is what we want to do. What's the sort of language we need to use or the creative, the artwork, the creatives to, to convince people and get through to them or even get the right of a hearing. That's what that that that's what it's about. Now, what yet in the elect the thing the you know I've taken a hit from I uh, you know within forty eight hours of losing the general election I said it's down to me and the reason it was down to me is because from seventeen to nineteen we never had we the two things hit us one was Brexit and I still don't know what was the solution there mm. because if we'd have gone for leave. Um, ardently, we would have lost the Remain voters. And remember, mm. if you looked at our polling of our own members, of 70% of our members were in favour of Remain. If we'd have gone ardently for Remain, as some people thought we did, I don't think we did, um, we would have lost all the Leave seats and we did lose a lot. And, uh, you know, we tried the classic, you know, let's try and bring all sides together, compromise British solution, that sort of thing. And it just didn't work. It was it was one of those contingencies on an issue that you couldn't win either way, whichever way you went. And especially if you had, if you're up against a political force like the Tory party, that is completely um, promiscuous. It, you know, the ideology is, and policies are irrelevant as long as they keep them in power no matter what and they protect and they protect capital. That's what they're about. So the Brexit thing was a contingency, but we, I still think that you can overcome those sort of contingencies if you have a clear enough narrative about what you're about and how your individual policies fit in with that story. You know, that's the basic hegemony from Gramsci, isn't it? You make everything common sense, but they all have to be linked into a common sense view of the world that you can, that you can argue. And we never had that. And what happened was, is that we came out of the 2017 election and thought, well, it could be just one more haul, anti-austerity, and that would be it. And it wasn't enough. We needed, we needed, and again, this is where some of the organisational factors come in, which was a bit annoying that come out in the report. We oh, no, we've lost we coherent, got... sorry, much more coherent analysis of society, communicated much more effectively around a narrative but also we needed to throw on the ground much more by way of community organisation as well. That was delayed for two years by MacNichol and others. But when we did get them on the ground, you saw in those constituencies just mm. how effective that turn of campaign was. So that's the, I think that's the situation that, that we were in at the time. John, do you think that, I think because in 2018, that's when the whole thing was at its most powerful. You get, the, yeah. you have you have the NEC, you have the General Secretary. And actually what's fascinating is in April, uh, Jenny Formby becomes General Secretary. That same month the People's Vote campaign yeah. does. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, at the time that wasn't really a big thing on the left radar. But do, do you think that if, if you and Jeremy Corbyn had said, look, this is our Brexit position and it's shared market, whatever, it could have been quite progressive. Uh, but we're not going to have a second referendum. We, we're going to make this a confidence issue. Do, do you not think the membership, it's very, look, I never said this at the time. I'm not, you know, no, no. But do, do you not think, I think the membership probably would have gotten behind you and said, no, you know no, what? I, yeah. no, no, Aaron, looking back on it, possibly, but I couldn't be sure. And mm. one of the issues then, remember, um, and this is where you get trapped in the Parliament, the Westminster bubble as well. That's mm. the worst thing. Um, one of the issues I was worried about was that I was worried at one point in time, my fear was that we were going to lose about 60 or 70 Labour MPs mm. to setting up the new party. Mm. And that, and at one point, I know it sounds laughable now because goodbye Chucker and Muna, thank goodness. There's something came out of that, that election that you can smile at, you know, but 
at the time, at the time we were faced with significant numbers. I thought we could be up to something like 60 or 70, financed incredibly heavily. And we mm. could have been in a situation then where some of our, a sizable amount of our membership went with them as well. Mm -hmm. So that was the other danger. People forget about that now. And you can say, well, that's because you were trapped in a parliamentary bubble. But actually, I went through the SDP period, and that's in my constituency. We lost my constituency during the SDP period because of that split. And that hung over me in particular, maybe not mm -hmm. others, but because of my age range, because my age it did hang, hang over me in that way. So that, that you may be right. I, I, who can tell at this point in time? I, I've tried to be ruthlessly honest with myself. You know, what did I do? The other thing as well, let's be honest, we bureaucratized. We became bureaucratized. There was a ring of steel around Jeremy's office sort of thing. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't build the social movement effectively that we wanted to build. We wanted all our thinking is about horizontalism. I know um, you need decision making processes. And yes, you need elements of hierarchy and different forms of organization about what you're about. But actually, the whole thing for us was building a social movement where the members were dr the driving force. Mm. And what happened was, as we degenerated into a bureaucracy as well, so that, again, we weren't sufficiently nourished organisationally. I think we were intellectually to a certain extent but from the membership, but mm. not organisationally to enable us then to build up the sort of social movement in time to do that. And again, the, the, the most important thing now in all these issues is to look for the future. But you look for the future by exploring the the you know what went right and what went wrong in the past and there, there's some of the elements bureaucratizing ourselves to a certain extent and the part of that is about the parliamentary bubble and all the rest of it too mm. not i think not building the social movement in a way um that we could have done soon enough but actually in this report you can see what we were up against you know if we'd have had i wanted 100 community organizers five years ago it took us two years and things were happening like um you know, we've got to consult with our union and that took ages about that. We haven't got the resources at the moment or we can't find the budget for it or the delay of the recruit. All of that sort of stunts were being pulled against us all the way through. So that sort of lesson about building the social movement, but you build it by community organising, the training of cadres so that they fully understand the world in which they're operating in, are clear about the sort of transformation that we want, making sure the party is thoroughly democratic so you overcome bureaucracy. And at the same time, the thing that was neglected throughout, well, it's been neglected for the last couple of decades, was political education within the movement. And that's why the world transformed as such a, a, a breakthrough, you know, that, mm. and I want, we wanted to make that a sort of almost a permanent daily organisational task to build the political education. And again, so they're the sort of lessons that need to be learned for the next stage of of the development of, of the left and, and socialism in this country. But, you know, you admit your mistakes and you move on. And mm. But you move on with optimism. We've still got, you know, nearly 600,000 members. We've still got people who are absolutely dedicated to the discussion of the sort of policies and platforms that we were putting forward. Uh, and the key issue for me, they keep, keep on people, people keep on saying, oh, we've got to defend the 17 and the 19 manifestos. Yeah, we have, but we've got to be more radical than that. You know, we've got to move on now. We've got to look mm. at the radical solutions that are needed. And the tragedy of coronavirus has opened up people's minds to much more radical solutions now that are essential to build the sort of society that we want. So I keep on saying to people, and, and people are bored listening to me, I suppose, is that all these wartime analogies at the beginning of the coronavirus thing that Johnson try to perpetrate on I mean, it, put it put across. I found, I thought, you know, I, I didn't go with it, to be honest. But if you are going to have a wartime analogy, during the Second World War, socialists and progressives, even at the worst, even at the most threatening time of the Second World War, when threatened by the Nazis, socialists and progressives were sitting down and looking back to the 30s and saying, never again, just as we're saying, never again to austerity, but also they were dreaming and planning and discussing the sort of society that they wanted after the war, after the crisis. And that's what we've got to do now. And that's some of the work that I'm involved in now. What sort of society? Well, what values do we want to underpin it? What are the foundation stones of that society? And we know a lot of it, but it builds upon 17 and 19 manifestos, but it needs to be much more radical. In terms of, in terms of what next for the left, I mean, 
I suppose that the first question is, one of the ironies of the Labour report is that so many people are, could be leaving over it that actually it just cements the political forces who who would defend precisely some of the worst offenders and they'll subsequently win roles on the NEC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or not defend them, but certainly not be as critical of them as, as you or I may be. So, so what would you say to people who are, perhaps they've been in the Labour Party, they canvassed in 2017, 2019, they maybe went to one or two meetings, but never that active. What would you say to them? Well, they've got to stay. Uh, you know, people saying, oh, I've had enough. We were let down. We betrayed this law has happened. Uh, that's, uh, they will throw away all that hard work of the last five years. They'll just throw it away overnight. Um, they've got to remind themselves. That we've got to just remind ourselves just how far we've come over the last five years. Mm. I keep saying it isn't just, you know, 600,000 members nearly, but, you know, real active, it's an active party now at every level. Now, there'll be some constituencies that's still not as welcoming as others, but actually... That membership is is pretty solid. The other thing is, just look at the intellectual architecture now. You know, the thing that we lost throughout the 80s and into the 90s was the sort of think tanks, the, the, the various structures that we had for the discussion of ideas and development of policies. We've now got uh, the one thing that says re-established over the last five years is a really solid intellectual architecture in think tanks. IPPR, radical radicalized under Tom Cabassi um, and uh, over the last few years. Class revitalized as an organization, autonomy, Commonwealth, New Economics Foundation, all of those now that are there, I think are fundamental to the development of ideas in the future. So that's been a real breakthrough. Political education is back on the agenda. The World Transform, I think, is a fantastic initiative. Momentum itself, um, as a rank and file organization, there's been all sorts of criticisms about how that became partially bureaucratized, but there's lots of people working in momentum, forward momentum now being launched as well, to look at how people can go forward and make it a really vibrant organization again, the way that it was before. So I think, and you've seen the um, initiative by other left groups um, have come together about the, uh, the under the slogan, um, don't leave, but organize. So I think this it's a really propitious period now in which one people need to be within the party if you leave the party you can go off and campaign in other on other worthwhile causes or in your trade union or the rest of it but when it comes to the development of policy or the future struggle you'll be shouting through the letterbox and looking through the keyhole you need to be in the room itself so i'm urging people to stay but also that it is as i say the tragedy of coronavirus has just opened up a whole new debate about the nature of our society and through the labor party we've got to shape that debate you know the lessons from the 10 years of austerity about the underfunding of our public services the lesson about we're tackling coronavirus solely about the only way we collect it is on a collective basis the role of the state rehabilitated the the values of our society about how we value not just the NHS workers and, and the, the social carers, but the people who collect our bins, the cleaners, etc. There's a potential of a huge reappraisal of our society and the values upon which it's founded at the moment. And stay, to stay within the party means you can contribute much more effectively to that reappraisal. And the debate with, the Labour, with a new leader, with Keir Starmer as, as the new leader, again, what we've got to do is create the climate of opinion in which Keir and others work with us along the agenda that we seek to set as a rank and file movement. I've worked with Keir in Shadow Cabinet over the last few years. We get on pretty well. We've always been uh, we've always been pretty friendly, but um, all the all the way through that, and he's always supported my economic policies. Um, and I think I actually think uh, the lesson for any incoming leadership is is listen to the members and make sure that you're taking people with you. And I think he's. I think he will do that. I think he will. And I think there's real potential there. The National Executive Committee, by the way, I think is absolutely important as well, because if we are um, going to have an independent investigation and it comes up with recommendations, we need a strong National Executive Committee to drive those recommendations through. That's why the, the slate making on the left for the next, next round of National Executive Committee um, elections is absolutely uh, critical. And uh, the left have just failed in the recent NEC elections because they couldn't agree a common slate. 
and I couldn't understand why why that took place. And um, it's a bit like that Western, isn't it? Next time the left gets together, they need to leave their guns at the saloon door, come in, sit down and sort out a proper slate for the NEC elections coming up. And in that way, I think you'll have an effect of NEC that will drive reforms through. Yeah, I think that. Can you hear me now, John? Yes, I can. Michael. Yeah, perfect. I'm going to ask a couple of questions from the audience, which sort of relate to what you've just said, and I'm going to mm. add a bit as well. So, Matt C1 UK asks, "How do we, how do we get party democratisation from our current position?" Um, and 2020, the death of oil uh, says, it's a "Very good name." What is a strategy for the left to prevent repeats of the establishment hindering even Labour electorally from within? Um, and I suppose both of those. Both of those questions were related to what you were just saying about about the yeah. NEC, because I think people will be, you know, fairly bewildered to see the fact that a split Labour left vote meant that the right got those two seats on the NEC, and there's about to be NEC elections coming up. And I suppose it probably is going to require some leadership to to bring all of these different strains together, because some of the conflicts seem quite irreconcilable to me. And and the other issue, I suppose, is that even if the left do win those seats on the NEC that's not necessarily going to be a majority. So there'll be lots of people watching this thinking, I've read the report. If when the left had the leadership, we couldn't you know, stop this happening and transform this happening, what hope do we have now there is someone from a different tradition at the top of this party? It's interesting because if you look at the report, if it is true, um, it reports on that period when the left didn't have control of the NEC and it was mm. a different general secretary. So there's an element of that there. But it doesn't matter actually. We've got to, we've got to have a real debate now about the nature of um, the sort of democracy that we want within the party, and we need to go back to some of the old traditional lessons about how bureaucracies form. Um, you know, it goes it goes right the way. It's in the left tradition. You know, Trotsky and all the rest of it did a lot on bureaucracy as a result of Stalinism. But it's Max Weber. Sociological studies all demonstrate just how how bureaucracies form and how you can overcome them by largely through direct di direct di democracy at every level, but it's got to be really p intensive participatory democracy. And to, for too long, our organisational form within the Labour Party is, has not facilitated that. So we need a real debate now. And actually, for these NEC elections, I think it is it does need a, a, a number of us just to really bang heads together if necessary, so we can't go through this again. Because for the life of me, I don't know what the political differences were between the different individuals standing on different slates in the, this recent round of NEC elections. And it seemed to be personality overriding politics. It was just bizarre, really. So I think people have to be honest about it. It was a huge mistake. I think we need to get the various left organisations into the same room and hammer out those differences. But the next NEC slate from the left should be a democracy slate. It should be about how we democratise the party more effectively and how do we prevent any bureaucracy like this, if it's true what happened, ever emerging again. So there's there's real potential there. Can I say also that um, we've focused on coronavirus and um, and, and um, democracy in the party, understandably. But, you know, the other big, um, the big crisis that's hanging over our heads as well is climate change. And we were moving quite dramatically on mm. in terms of policy making around that, infusing people. Um, and also our link up with Extinction Rebellion, whatever people thought about Extinction Rebellion, I know there's lots of criticisms. Nevertheless, the link up with them demonstrated we can work alongside effectively a social movement again. So I think there's all sorts of issues there that we need to address very, very quickly. Otherwise, um, there's a ticking clock out there that we're um, that we're not going to meet the deadlines that are essential just to save the planet. So I wouldn't uh, in any conversation I have, I always come around to reminding people that that's the case or others remind remind me as, as well. So I think there's it's. It's democracy within the party. It can be done. It's just making sure it's a thorough democracy at every level. Um, you know, there's all sorts of arguments about even electing party officials rather than just having them appointed. Um, because at the moment, if this report is true, people were appointed not because of their professional skills, but because of their political leanings and their political commitments. And that didn't work either. We want people, who are pro we need people with those relevant professional skills, but maybe we should extend the principle of election a bit bit wider within our appointed systems that we have at the moment. I'm going to go to one final audience question. Uh, love FB hate FIFA. What do you think of Denmark's policy for financial assistance to business during the crisis? 
So i.e. not granting money to tax avoiding companies. Um, should Labour be pushing the government to do the same? Okay. I put a proposal up before I stood down as Shadow Champ Chancellor. If you look at the papers, I published them online. If you look at the papers we put to Rishi Sunak um, from the earliest stages, before he'd announced anything, um, we were saying, first of all, 100% um, protection wages, not 80%. What we put forward is 80% from the state, 20% from the employer, compulsory. So if any employer wanted support from the state, they had to put their 20% in. That was the first thing. The second thing was as well, um, we also said if we're putting loans and other factors into companies themselves, um, we should also take the option of equity stakes if necessary. So you would bring in elements into public ownership or forms of ownership that could include worker control as well. So again, we, we were developing all of that. We also said at that stage, we should not be supporting companies who are tax avoiding on, 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 in an aggressive way. Um, and that brings into a question, um, if you remember, uh, no, you won't, but I, uh, people have forgotten it, but I put a tweet out about Branson uh, and what we should be, I don't see why we should be funding Branson in any way. And he'll use the threat of workers' jobs against us. Well, that's fair enough. If he, if he wants to do that, we'll provide the resources which will bring it back into public ownership. But people seem to forget that the aviation, aviation industry worked very effectively in public ownership for a long period of time. And it's the same with Heathrow Airport, who uh, last week, um, uh, well, I lost my rag with them, to be honest. Uh, Heathrow Airport's in my constituency, and they got a lot of publicity about promising everyone they'd pay the London living wage, and that included for the cleaners and the security who were all on very low pay. And we pronounced, and I congrats them, they were brilliant. Then they've used the crisis now to pull back from that commitment. Outrageous. We should wrap up in a moment. Aaron, do you want to come in? First? I guess I've got I've got one final question. Um, I want to first of all thank everybody who's given a super chat. Um, I haven't got the YouTube running, but there's been a hell of a lot of them. Maybe we can just get a few more to run along the bottom. Uh, if you like what you're watching, if you think we need to build a me new media for different politics, uh, go to navaramedia.com forward slash support. Uh, we've been doing lots of podcasts, daily podcasts with The Burner, Navara FM, Tisky Sours, uh, lots of articles. We want to do so much more of that in the next one year, two years, five years. Five years from now, we really want to be making the weather politically. So help us do that. Go to navaramedia.com forward slash support. Uh, I guess I've got, for me, a final question for you, John, because you were the Shadow Chancellor, um, and you were very accomplished with Keynesian economics, which is quite clearly what we're now going to have to do. You were very comfortable with the history, the theory, the practice of, of, of the kinds of economics we're now going to have to engage on. Do you think that the Labour Party, particularly under the leadership of Keir Starmer, has the kind of intellectual furniture to make sense of what we've now got to do. So I was talking to Adam Tooze last week and he said what we now need is a return to trying to grow nominal GDP, get inflation up. We're gonna you know, use inflation and haircuts to get down debt. We can't just talk about austerity. Not even the Tories can no. just talk about austerity because there's gonna be so much debt everywhere. And it, it feels like what I'm hearing so far from, and it's not to be critical, I think Annalise Dodds is an exceptional appointment, but it, it does feel to me like the right man for the job, a shadow chancellor, the right person for the job, what was you in this context? Do you, do you think that Labour will adapt to this with Keir Starmer as leader? Because for all of his strengths, you know, he's he's a lawyer. He's not somebody that comes from a, a policy yeah. background or a political economy background. OK. Uh, Anne Lee Dodds was my recommendation. She's excellent. She was in my team. She's actually extremely bright. Uh, and um, I think extremely articulate as well. Comes across well in the media. And, and she, I think she'll be terrific as, as Shadow Chancellor and eventually as Chancellor. This is my take on all of this, um, and people need to, uh, we need to have this discussion about it. Uh, the options now are a group of Tories will clearly, are already pushing for austerity to be used. That's the first mm -hmm. thing. Um, and we saw that, if you remember, 10 days ago, when the raise, rise in the minimum wage was supposed to be introduced, and a group of Tories and some right-wing think tanks tried to prevent it mm. on the basis that we can't afford it. So there will be some who want to go back to austerity. The wiser heads amongst the Tories will say, no, we need to maintain fiscal stimulus and develop it. But it's a sort of Tory Keynesianism. So in other words, the fiscal stimulus will be to benefit businesses. Now, Christine <laughs> Berry um, did a talk I was on the other night and she said, look, if you look at the support mechanisms at the moment, 
most of it is to sustain businesses as they are, is mm. to return to what they think is normal. Well, normal isn't good enough for us. It isn't good enough because it means precarious work, low wages, uh, lack of ownership or control of your company or firm or your the sector that you're working in. That isn't good enough. So our argument should be is that the state has to play a role here. It can't be... Um, Tory Keynesianism, it's got to be something more radical than that. So the state will have a role to make both in terms of monetary and fiscal policy. But what are we getting out of it? Are mm. we genuinely getting a redistribution of rewards in our society on a fairer basis, not just through fair taxation, but through proper wages? But also, are we getting democratic control of our lives, both in terms of the wider economy, both also in terms of the individual firm or operation that people are working. That's the agenda that we've got to set. I think Annalisa's up for that. I think I think Keir is, but it doesn't matter. Those individuals, of course, they're in influential positions, but it's got to be the movement as a whole. So at the moment, I'm doing some, we're launching in a couple of weeks' time, uh, working with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, where we're looking at um, putting together a, a, just a project for up until... Uh, mid-June, I think it is, we're looking at, and then into September, but mid-June immediately, is what is the sort of society that we want to come out of this crisis? What is the economy we, we have to build? And what is the fundamentals of that in terms of the the, the values upon which we want to build it upon? The, <coughs> and socialism, um, what socialism is in a summary is the achievement of equality through democracy. So that's the sort of values that we want to build that society on. And we'll, we'll translate the overall analysis and program and individual policies from those values. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us now. I think the new Labour leadership, if we can create such a climate of opinion, I think they'll go for it because actually it's what's needed and it's what people, I think, will start demanding. The last thing we want to do, and I was in a debate or discussion, there was a wonderful Italian um, woman politician, I've forgotten her name, and she was on the other night and she said, she said, People keep on talking about going back to normal. We, normal is is what is what's caused us the problem. We can't allow it to go back to normal. We've got to have a new normal, and that new normal is based upon progressive and socialist values. So that I, th this is an extremely exciting period, and it's one in which people they can't sit on the sidelines on this one. You know, we we this is although we lost the election in December. We're now in a situation where we're in the one of the most fundamental debates that we'll have, certainly of this generation at the moment. I mean, that's a brilliant point to uh, end the show. Uh, a call to arms as well as a sort of analysis of the present and the future. John McDonnell, it's always an absolute pleasure to have you on Tisky Sour. Can I just say thanks for what you do on Novara? I say this every time and people think mm. I'm groveling just to come back on again. All right. Mm. Thanks for what you do and some of the stuff you're doing at the moment. It's courageous, really. It means is. a lot, Thanks John. That doesn't and yeah, definitely, we will, we'll, we'll be wanting your analysis throughout this crisis. Um, you don't have to grovel, not not remotely. <laughs> uh, Aaron Bastani, thank you for joining me. Always a pleasure. 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 Um, and as you know, uh, Navarra Media is only possible because of your kind support. If you were already <laughs> a subscriber, if you've been putting super chats in the comments today, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you are not already, please go to navaramedia.com forward slash support and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month or give us a coronavirus lockdown bonus. Um, we'll be back tomorrow night, hopefully, most likely, uh, with a Harvard epidemiologist, Bill Hanage. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty uh, of the, the science of coronavirus and especially possible exit strategies. Uh, I've been Michael Walker. You've been watching Tisky Sour. Good night.